Hello and welcome back to Boulder Cats. Now, in today's episode, I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm genuinely going to try and help somebody. And the person I'm going to try and help is a flat earther. Now, this flat earther is a, a rude and arrogant flat earther, for sure. Um, a walking, talking example of Dunning-Kruger, absolutely. However, they do genuinely need help. So I'm not going to ridicule them in this video, ish. What I'm going to do is really try and point them in the right direction and get the gears turning. Now, this did start last week and I've linked my first video that started all this off, I suppose, in the description. However, if you don't want to watch that, here's a little catch up. So this guy here goes by the YouTube name of that guy. And that guy sent me a series of abusive messages just like this one, in which he told me he had an experiment which I was too scared to look at because it totally debunks gravity. Testing the theory that gravity is what's holding the air and water and everything to Earth. So when I checked out his video, he decided he was going to take a plastic bottle and create a vacuum with it. But when you create a vacuum, and I put my finger over here, that's a vacuum inside there. I know, that wasn't a vacuum. Anyway, he took his bottle and he put it upside down in a jar full of water. And as the bottle expanded, water naturally entered into the bottle, leading him to the conclusion that vacuums suck, and therefore the vacuum space should rip the atmosphere right off the earth, meaning that space is fake. I responded by showing him this very simple child's experiment which shows that you cannot suck water from a sealed container because simply the reason the water went into the bottle or up the straw is because of the weight of the air due to gravity pushing down on the water, not because vacuums suck. And here was his response. Intellectually dishonest. Either he is that stupid or he's straight lying and being dishonest. And unsurprisingly the insults kept coming. You're a moron, body cats. Idiot. Thanks for noticing. You actually have to think about the shit that you say. Yeah, funny you should say that, and you'll see the irony of that comment pretty soon, I think. Now, that guy, as he's known, did make a response video to me, but I'm not going to take his response video and address all the points, um, because even for me, it is ridiculously low-hanging fruit. For example, one of the comments he posted and one of the points he made in that video was this comment here, where he literally says that the number zero is nowhere near the number 0.0000001. Now all I can say to that is, if you come around to my house and you build a fence for me, I will pay you no dollars and you won't be very happy. But then, if you come around the next week and you paint the fence for me, I will pay you 0.0000001 dollar. And you'll feel like you've had a massive pay rise because those numbers are nowhere near each other. Brilliant. Um, what else did he say? Yeah, he said this. Learn what vacuums are. You cannot have a gradient from high pressure to low pressure. Only high to a lower high. Do you understand? Now, his whole video was full of little gems like that, so you probably understand now that I use the term low-hanging fruit. And I'm not gonna take the easy route and take his video and ridicule it. I've put it in the description so you can watch it and you can, you can see for yourself, really, the, the mistakes that he's made. But what I'm gonna do for you, that guy, um, well, let's take a look. Yes, I have made for you a flat earth defense kit. And after watching this, I don't expect you to immediately jump to the globe because I know that's not how it works. But what I do expect is if you've watched and you've listened over the next few weeks, you'll have so many nagging little doubts that you'll want to know more. And you may actually start learning and doing proper research rather than just watching flat earth debate shows and picking up your nonsense from there. I think in the long run, this is going to be a good cure for you. Let's get started. So what I've tried to do in putting this kit together for you is not pick out the obvious things that you'll have heard over and over again. Some of these arguments, some of them may be familiar with. I'm hoping that one or two uh, are new to some people. But let's start with the idea that density is responsible for things falling and not gravity. Um, and let's use the common pendulum. Now, pendulums swing back and forth and they gain height and they lose height. But the interesting thing about a pendulum is we can predict exactly how long the time period for one full swing will be. Now, according to you, density is the only reason that things fall. In that case, when we're predicting the time period of a pendulum, you would imagine that somewhere in that equation, we would find density, which is mass divided by volume. But when we actually look, we find that there's actually no mention of density, mass or volume in that equation whatsoever, even though the equation works 100% of the time, absolutely perfectly. What we do find, however, is the time period of a pendulum is dependent on the length of the string and little g, which is acceleration due to gravity which, by the way, can be calculated using the gravitational constant, the mass of the Earth, divided by the radius of the Earth squared. 
So according to your model, density and not gravity is the reason things fall. It's the reason that a pendulum, when it gets to the top of its swing, is going to start coming back down to the bottom of its swing. So isn't it incredible that there is literally no equation out there that incorporates the density of a pendulum to the time period of its swing? But there are equations that accurately predict that time period using gravity. Just let that sink in for you. And let's move on. Now, something else we can do that's perfectly predictable and perfectly reproducible and perfectly accurate is to predict the speed something will be traveling at just before it hits the ground if you drop it from a known height. Now, in your model, things fall because of density. But when we have a look at the equation we use to perfectly predict the speed something's going to be traveling at the floor, there's no mention of density, there's no mention of mass, there's no mention of volume. In fact, v squared equals u squared plus 2as contains that little a in it, which is acceleration due to gravity, little g. So yet again, isn't it incredibly frustrating to you that when we're talking about the physics of things falling, if we want to perfectly predict and accurately predict how fast something's going to be traveling when it hits the ground, we don't use density. Density is completely irrelevant in those calculations, but what is relevant is acceleration due to gravity. You would think that if density was the reason things fell, that somehow we would be able to use it to predict how something was going to fall, but we don't. That should bother you. It should bother you massively. Now, a brilliant little experiment that allowed us to calculate the exact charge on an electron was Millikan's oil drop experiment, where Millikan took drops of oil and calculated the gravitational force pulling down each of those drops of oil. And then he looked at the electrical force needed to suspend that drop of oil in the middle of the container. And from that, he was able to work out the exact charge of an electron. What you'll notice is that because the oil type he used was the same for every single droplet, the density of the oil was not different. Now that really is a fantastic little experiment and I do urge you to look at it, but essentially Millikan used the force of gravity pulling uh, an oil droplet down. And remember, all those oil droplets had an identical density, they were the same oil. So he used the force of gravity pulling it down due to its mass to calculate essentially the charge on an electron. Now you can say that that was a flawed experiment, as long as you're prepared to admit that you don't believe in silly, stupid little things like capacitors or transistors or rechargeable batteries or electric circuits. Other than that, it should quite bother you that density was again completely irrelevant and the force of gravity has been able to produce something that's been so useful for us and all of mankind. Now, before I go any further, I want to credit this man for what I am about to say. This is Team Skeptic and he mentioned this to me when I was on a live stream with him a couple of weeks ago. I've linked his channel in the description. Um, it's well worth checking out if you're not aware of him already. Please give him a subscription. So, Team Skeptic suggested that if density was the reason that things fell, then we should simply take some weighing scales and choose a very, very big object, a heavy object, that isn't very dense. Like this aircraft carrier you're about to see. That aircraft carrier is floating on the water, which means it must be less dense than water. We are then going to take an object that is more dense than water, like a bowling ball, and we're going to place that on the other side of the weighing scale. Now, if objects only fall because of density and things trying to find their equilibrium, then that bowling ball should be lower on that weighing scales than the aircraft carrier. But for some reason, it's not. It's almost as if the fact that the bowling ball is more dense than the aircraft carrier literally has no effect whatsoever. And there's another force at play. So the bowling ball is clearly more dense than water because it sinks. The aircraft carrier is clearly less dense than water because it floats. So why, when I put them on the scales, if density is the reason things fall, why doesn't the bowling ball find its equilibrium, as you like to say, at a lower position than the aircraft carrier? It's almost as if density as a, a model for things falling has literally no predictive capabilities whatsoever. But we've already seen the predictive capabilities when we use the gravitational model. This should really start to be bothering you. Let's move on. Now, observations of Polaris are something we can all do ourselves and they are a 100% flat Earth killer. Anybody that understands anything about trigonometry, anybody that understands anything about high school maths knows that the observations of Polaris absolutely stone dead kill any idea of a flat earth. And why is that? Well, take a look at these two pictures here. When we make our observations of Polaris on earth, we find that for every 111.3 kilometers we move, either north or south, Polaris will change its angle in the sky by one degree. 
Now, this allows us, using the heliocentric model, to make perfect and precise predictions. So I know when I go on holiday to the south coast in a few weeks, I know exactly the angle that Polaris will be in the sky because I know exactly how far south I've gone. However, using the flat Earth model, as we can see from the diagrams above, as I drove down to the south coast, Polaris would have to physically change its position in the sky just so I could see it at that one degree difference. Now, clearly, that's totally ridiculous, showing that the flat Earth model has zero predictive capabilities, yet again, when we're talking about observations of the stars. Now, because I know this is going to be brought up in the comment section, if you have a look at the numbers I've used on the graph, what I've concentrated on there is just having a 111.3 kilometre difference between the top diagram and the bottom diagram, and a one degree difference between the top diagram and the bottom diagram. I am not stating that Polaris is only 60 odd kilometers above the earth you can really start with any numbers as long as those numbers are 111.3 kilometers apart you'll find that the distance polaris will be different on both diagrams so yet again the heliocentric model is allowing us to make perfect reproducible predictions about our observations of the stars now at this point it's not even a presupposition you can't say we're just assuming that the earth is a globe because we can apply this maths to any shape we can say well would this work if the earth was a square or a triangle or a flat disc and what we'll find is only one shape only one explains and predicts our observations of polaris and that's the one we're left with which is a sphere and that's not the only observation of the stars that you can do yourself Another well-known feature of the heliocentric model that you can try yourself is the ability to predict accurately which stars in the sky will and won't be circumpolar from any given point on the Earth. Circumpolar means that it will not dip below the horizon. Now, to calculate if a star is circumpolar, we simply ask, is the declination of that star greater than 90 minus the latitude of the observer? And if the answer is yes, that star will be circumpolar. This means I can accurately predict which stars I will and will not be able to see being circumpolar when I go on holiday. And I'll be correct. And once again, once you've made those predictions yourself and you've done the observations yourself, you can then apply that mass to a whole range of geometric shapes. Will it work on a square planet, a flat planet, and so on? And what you'll find is the only planet this works on is a spherical planet. It really is that simple. Let's finish. And just to finish up, let's show some pictures of mountains casting shadows on the clouds above them. Something that's only possible if the sun is below the height of the mountain. Something that will be totally impossible on a flat earth. However, perfectly predictable and observable on a globe earth. Now, that guy, I hope this video has helped you. And going forward, I hope these questions mull over in the mind and you realise that using density instead of gravity has literally no predictive capabilities whatsoever. And it only has flaws in the argument. And I could have made this video two hours long. I haven't even talked about why objects actually fall towards the Earth when the path of least resistance is above the Earth. Because we know, if we take a look at this picture here, as demonstrated by the simple crisp packet, as we go up in altitude, the air pressure and the air density actually gets less. So if objects really do fall because of differences in density, then why can't that model explain why they fall downwards instead of upwards where the density difference is much bigger? It literally makes no sense. Um, I'm not really interested in your response and I'm not really interested in getting into a head-to-head -head with you because I don't want to ridicule people that say stuff like this anymore. Learn what vacuums are. You cannot have a gradient from high pressure to low pressure only high to a lower high. Do you understand? You see, a very wise man told me lately to go after the con men and not the cons. And that guy, unfortunately, you really are one of the cons. I can hear you regurgitating all the same stuff that comes out of the Flat Earthers all over YouTube, the Flat Earth debate team, the Globebusters team, and you regurgitate it with an obvious lack of any understanding of what the heliocentric model actually says. And if you understood it, you'd realise there were no contradictions and there was no problems. But you've been conned by these people on YouTube who are making a pretty penny out of it. So let me help you and let conspiracy cats go after the idiots.